We acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. This is Cheryl from Jajawarong Country. Welcome to the latest edition of Beyond 90 Pod. Just two of us to start, but uh, Dale Roots will be joining shortly. So if you don't know already, I'm Eric and I'm happy to be joined. And it's a kind of like a new tradition, if that makes sense, by um, uh, hardcore Brisbane Raw fan, Madge. So how are you yeah. going, Madge? I'm happy. I'm, I'm enjoying life and I've had Matilda's games. I've had international news happening. So yeah, ready to get into it. Cool. Okay. So, and starting the, uh, I think the brilliant tradition oh, well, uh, that Cheryl has done in the last few weeks, which is uh, Nate um, going through the history of previous Matildas to match the episode numbers. So this yeah. is episode number 68. So she's actually given us cap 67 and cap 68. So cap number 67, Tracy Bartlett, cap 68, Sharon Black. They both debuted in 1991 with uh, Tracy playing 64 but games for Matildas and Sharon playing 66 games. So Tracy was a defender. 51 of her games were A internationals. She scored one goal for the Matildas in a 1991 World Cup qualifier and in 1999 voted as Australian Women's Player of the Year. Mm-hmm. Now, Sharon was a midfielder and in her 61 A international games scored 20 times. She also played and be- internationally and because she's Australian, that meant she played with Fortuna Hearing. Of and, she, of course, yeah. and she appeared in the 2003 UEFA Women's Cup final alongside Alison Foreman. So, oh, uh, well, there's a connection yes. right there. Yes. And uh, Tracy and Sharon both named in the FFA 1990s team of the decade. So that's today's history's lesson. Now, um, so I thought we should jump in straight to, to the hot topics. But firstly, some news hot off the press that I wanted to surprise Madge with. Hmm. Brisbane Raw have signed Natalie Tatham. So, oh. Yes. You know what? That's not too much of a surprise because I have seen her in a few social media posts just in the background. And so I recognise that. Ah, like, it's a bit like that. Yeah. So, um, so no, that's great to have Nat back. Um, she, of course, had that really that awful injury. I mean, against in Brisbane Royal playing mm-hmm. against the victory when that when that injury happened, which was really awful. And then um, but I mean, victory like absolutely like looked like they took absolutely fantastic care of her, but um during the season and, and rehabbing that injury. But it's, yeah, it's absolutely great to have her back in Brisbane. Yes, and I'm delighted because Nat Tatham has a futsal background. So it's all, oh. it smiles all around from that latest signing. And I think you were telling me just before we started, there's meant to be another signing coming this week? Apparently, yes. I was at the um, the Brisbane Raw uh, team launch that was on Saturday here in Brisbane uh, and spoke to Gareth. And so you said there were two signings this week. So that's obviously the first one. And um, so hopefully we should hear another one uh, yeah. during the week sometime. And it's all good. Um, Canberra also announcing two signings tomorrow morning. And it's it's way different to like, well, most of the history of this competition where, what are we, like a month out? And I mean, really, it wasn't too long ago when we would have heard absolutely nothing from the entire competition about signing. So yep. I, I love to see this. Yeah. So I, well, I, saw, I saw the post. So Canberra's are still a mystery. They're, they're still yeah. coming this week. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. So let's go oh, going on to the hot topics. First, I mean, there's a lot to get in the past week, as you alluded to, Madge. Um, firstly, they've announced the logo for the FIFA Women's World Cup. Uh, what do you, and also the motto, Beyond Greatness. So uh, first, what are your thoughts, Madge? Well, I'm going to put it right out there. I, I do have a bit of an aversion to footballs in team logos and in logos in general. But, you know, it's, it's, I, I quite like the meaning um, around it, uh, the... Um, of course, we've got the football in the middle and we've got the, the 32 squares around the outside. Um, but what I think what I like most about it uh, is the, the designs from uh, you know, Indigenous uh, Australian artists and, and, and Maori artists um, that's been included in the, um, in the design and, and the uh, articles to, to be um, used throughout the World Cup. So I think they're really great. Um, the, the thing, you know, the logo, it's a, um, I'm sorry, the, um, the, the slogan, it's a slogan. It's, it's a big corporate. It's um, beyond greatness. I guess all the good slogans have already been taken, mm-hmm. but um, uh, 
you know, it is what it is. Uh, I don't think anyone's going to be um, particularly throwing that one around for years to come, but um, but I'm sure it's something that we'll uh, get used to seeing uh, in relation to the branding uh, throughout uh, the, the couple of years going up to the World Cup. Um, what I do like is I really like the colours. So I think they could probably do some good things with the colours. And I think um, in their release, they were talking about how the colours represented the, the natural landscapes of both Australia and New Zealand. So I think they could do some really interesting stuff with the colours that they've um, they've built into the logo there. Yeah, and I think you make a good point about the colours because one thing with this colour scheme, you're not going to miss this logo. It's not blending into anything. So and I think that's really... And that's a good job then by the designers because I mean, it really the point of a logo is to stand out. I do have a minor gripe with the right side of it where it's um and the where it kind I know what they're trying to go for AUNZ 2023, but it can be read as AU 20 NZ 23. I think so, I saw someone say that just looks like a rugby score. Yes, like, <laughs> like a Bledisloe Cup game where we've been done by a last minute field goal basically. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so, which is probably okay. appropriate. So yeah, I mean, make actually make. I mean, that's better. That's a real Trans Tasman storyline that's been going on for more than a century. So maybe that's what they were going for. In which case, good on them. Yep. Um. So I think other than that, also big news just before the announcement of this logo, they could have spaced this out a little bit better. If I'm being honest, um, the draw for January's Asian Cup mm. uh, was done and last week, and yeah, I mean. Yeah, you get first pick, Madge. Where do you start? There's, I don't, I barely know where to start with these um, three groups. Look, I mean, I'm going to start with just the song because I, I mean, I tweeted about this, but the song that was playing on the stream, I love it. I don't know if it's an official song or not, or if it's some sort of just generic um, music, but put it, put it on the opening for the the games and like the Champions League song because it was great. It was um, really rousing. So yeah, get on, get on YouTube and and check out the. Um, the, the replay of the stream but yeah so I mean it, it was it was after you know it was clear that probably groups B and C were probably going to be uh the the interesting groups and and we got drawn in in um in B in B and of course probably the big talking point is taking on uh the Philippines with uh with uh ex Matilda's coach Alan Sajic uh now being announced as coach so that should be a really good, uh, a really good you know, matchup, and there'll be no doubt lots of uh, commentary and narrative around around the the meeting of the Matildas and the Philippines, and and so and, and so what the Matil the um, Philippines team, they've got a nickname as well. They do. Yeah. So it's real. It's it's basically an anagram, isn't it? Yeah, I think you swap like two letters, the Malditas, which yeah. um, depending on who you ask it either means feisty women or potentially a more extreme adjective oh okay <laughs> I mean, i've heard wicked women is as a translation yes. so uh yeah so we're, maybe that's something to get clarified before the tournament but whatever that's that's another angle and i'm uh, glad to me the philippines has always been the headline so i'm glad the rest of the country is finally seeing things the same way as i am <laughs> but for, firstly we should probably um officially welcome dale thanks thanks so much for joining us dale uh, but yeah what what stands out to you in terms of the Asian Cup draw? Uh, I think obviously, uh, I mean the, the the group that Australia's drawn. I mean, it's not going to draw like raise too many eyebrows. I think it's um, you know uh, obviously it's statistically the weakest group. Mm -hmm. um, one one thing for me is it's interesting that uh, like the, my memory may be mis mis serving me here, but this is an expanded tournament format. There's usually yep. only eight teams that go that's, through. That's correct. So it's it's really cool to see uh, Indonesia and Iran there. So that's really good. But but also like I mean out, outside of uh, like the obvious kind of Australia versus Philippine rivalry, it is cool that like you've got uh, China and Taiwan or Chinese Taipei um, in one group. You've got Japan and South Korea and Vietnam and Myanmar. Obviously, you know not exactly best of mates um, either. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's really good that there's you know some pretty cool. Uh, rivalries there uh, i will also be interested to see who takes that like the uh, you know best second place team um because yeah it's it's interesting with this obviously it doesn't really matter to us because this is really just like a kind of fun side hustle that we've put together to get some more friendly games really but uh like oh, it's not a qualification 
It's not a qualification for us. <laughs> so like it's like if we don't win the Asian Cup, I'm not like fretting is my is more my point. But um it is yeah, it'll be it'll be cool to see uh who takes that like fifth or sixth spot when it comes to world cup qualification like uh, we might see you know a vietnam or you know a, we might see a philippines go to the world cup which would be pretty cool considering they've both got you know really big uh really big kind of diaspora populations in australia yeah that would be quite uh something uh i did did like to know group b is basically an aff tournament Australia, Thailand, <laughs> yes. Indonesia. Yeah, yes. I thought that as well. Yeah. Also, um, uh, you make a good point, Dale, about Iran and Indonesia. It's Iran's first time in the Women's Asian mm. Cup. Indonesia, it's be their first time since 1989, I think. So. I yes. mean, it's interesting because Iran are far and away the best futsal team in Asia. Yes. Um. So, like, if they can, obviously, uh, there's the kind of, uh, the, obviously, it's a bigger field and there's more people on it. But like, if they have that kind of close control that they would in in futsal like they've won something like the last four afc uh like futsal tournaments so they're very very good um obviously the way things are in in iran at the moment means that they don't really get to play a lot of uh full you know full senior games so i'll I'll be really interested to see how they go um really good matchup with them and uh with them in india as well kind of similarly ranked teams not really i wouldn't really call them superpowers uh in a footballing sense but yeah be cool to see yeah i'm also looking forward to the population derby between india and china yes fantastic yes it, it's i'm i'm gonna be interested to see how these games go in terms of um like turnout because remember that these games were going to be spread all across the country and now they've all been moved to mumbai, mumbai yeah it's mumbai. yeah so they announced through the um during the draw i think they announced that they weren't going to have spectators I could be wrong. Which is interesting. Not surprising though. As it was happening. So I was like, oh, did I hear that right? And someone said mm. that was the case. So, which isn't surprising, unfortunately. But, um, yeah. But, you know, it still gets eyes on the country. And um, so that's, you know, still, still great from a, um, yeah. a viewership point of view. Yeah. So I think we'll crack on, go on to <clears throat> signings. And basically, last, uh, I think, since our last pod, it's basically been all Wellington in terms of dub signings, uh, signing New Zealand under 17 international and uh, Jets Academy player Mona Walker, as well as their first two Australians, Isabel Gomez, who was with the Wanderers last season, and Kush LaRue, who's from Football New South Wales Institute and has made a Matilda's Talent ID camp, I believe. They also, um, I, I did like this move from FA. They were given special dispensation to get um, a couple more Kiwis in the form of scholarship players. So that would be uh, Charlotte Lancaster and Alyssa Winham, who are both quite young, but, you know, obviously been talent ID'd. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, how all of those go. Uh, do you have any major thoughts on Wellington signing, Dale? Uh, I'm really glad to see Mona Walker get a gig. Uh, I think she'll be the the third Maori player in the W League this season or in the A-League women this season mm-hmm. um, with uh, Paige Satchel and... Now you're going to make me think of the other one. Never mind. Uh, there's definitely three. I have. We mentioned this off mic previously. Mm-hmm. Um, they've also just announced their uh, backroom staff. Grace Dale. Which, ah, yeah. Very well done. Um, yeah, we we as I said, they've they've uh, they've announced their backroom staff as well. So like, uh, it'll be interesting to see how like this is you know very much a. a uh, a, a double, well, an A-League women's team in the NPL kind of vibe. Um, got a lot of really young players, but I'm really, really excited to see how the, some of these girls go. And, and I mean, not saying that with any disrespect because some of them are still legally children. Um, but yeah, it'll be really cool. I'll be um, I'll be looking forward to it. Um, they've got a fairly decent base there and if they're going to be playing out of Wollongong as well, which I think they announced yes, this week too. That so, is correct. Um, and both both the men and the women will be playing there, which I think will be really good. Kind of keeps. It, it's one thing that I, I really like that that Wellington are looking to have done with this. Obviously, they've had some issues around getting sponsorship for the team, but um, if they can kind of keep them in you know in one hub, obviously it keeps costs down for them, but also it just you know maintains that kind of like um, one club, two teams philosophy, which we really mm-hmm. want to see in in Australian football. Yeah, and I like that they're not just women; they're not just based in Wollongong oh sorry they are based in Wollongong as a mm. as well as playing at Wynn Stadium the men yeah. weren't quite so lucky so they're based they'll be based in northern Sydney but uh yeah it's, it'll be I like it 
just basically it can really set up a camp in Wollongong. So, and I mean, that's, I mean, that's more football for um, obviously the yeah. us, New South Wales South Coast community. There's some really, really good facilities down there as well. Like um, Wolves obviously play at, well, they played at, uh, what was it? Um, Albert, they played Albert? in, yeah, like Cannon Hooker or somewhere. Yeah. Um, this week, got uh, Port Kembla this week against Sydney in their in their men's uh, trial. Mm-hmm. Um, but the uni there has, like, I, I have to say this as an ex student, but the uni there has fantastic facilities. The Dragons used to use them uh, before they kind of got their own training base. But you know, they're they're definitely top tier facilities um, if if the women choose to use them. And, and if if not, they've got you know access to whatever they need around the city. Sydney, will, you know, obviously it's. The best place for elite sport, but Wollongong's probably not far behind, especially in terms of research and stuff. Yeah. So then, and um, yeah, just something uh, Maj and I were discussing before we joined. Brisbane have literally just announced Natalie Tatham, and of course, there's uh, your mob, Cambria United, who'll be announcing two signings mm. tomorrow. So this will be who could they be? Companies keep trickling. Who knows? In. I'm sure, Stefan knows. Stefan knows everything. Yeah, <laughs> he's not telling me though, but I'm sure he knows. <laughs> <laughs> now on. Now we're going off to Europe because it wasn't just the Asian Cup draw. They also did the Euro 2022 draw. Now, as I, well, this, this makes, this collection of 16 teams makes me sad every time I look at it because I don't have a, a horse in the race, so to speak. But uh, mm. Madge, did you, uh, anything stand out for you about uh, the Euro 2022 draw? Oh, I mean, when you've got that quality um, in that confederation, there's always going to be a group of depth. And I think there's kind of, Two, but I mean, there's probably one that's absolutely um, stands out: Germany, Denmark, Spain, and Finland. Sorry, yeah. Finland. Ouch. <laughs> yeah. mm. um, up for a hard time there, but uh, yeah, that I mean, that's a tough, tough group. Um, I'm actually not sure what the qualification is into. Oh, so we've got four groups. So oh, that's just a straight top well, two. This is yeah. oh, it's two. Oh yeah, top yep. two into the quarterfinals. Oh so, yeah, so you've got a. Denmark, Spain, or Germany missing yep. out on the, on quarterfinals, so that's yep. that's really tough. I mean, even England in the first group, um, you know, you got Austria, Norway, and Northern Ireland. I mean, Norway uh, always get up for big tournaments, but then of course the other the other big one is France, Italy, and Belgium, and then uh, and Iceland as well. So, yeah, groups um, groups uh, B and D definitely look the toughest there. Mm. I mean, like you mentioned Group B, uh, before the Netherlands won in 2017, I think that Germany had won every tournament all the way back until 1993, um, which is fairly impressive. Uh, Also, shout out to Sweden, who won, if I remember correctly, they won the very first uh, women's championship, which was back then just called like, you know, four teams playing football because UEFA didn't really take much notice of it, um, but were led by Pia Sundhager, who was the golden boot winner at the first championship. Um, but, I mean, it's just going to be really cool seeing, like, because crowds are back in England um, and this tournament's not kicking off for another seven months, but it'll be really cool to see um, some decent venues getting some decent crowds too. They've, they've kind of spread this out around uh, around the country. Uh, Birmingham won't be hosting any games. Birmingham is the second biggest city in England, uh, but it's hosting the Commonwealth Games at the same time. So um, they obviously the Midlands won't really be involved, but like there's, there's games on from London to, you know, from Brighton to London to Sheffield to, uh, to uh, Manchester as well. So, you know, uh, it, it should be good. Good, good. Uh, we love tournament football. Yep. Now on to I should have, I mean, as usual, I haven't prepared. I'm trying to find out uh, the results from Japan and more specifically. Uh, speaking. Oh, that's right. Uh, what we were talking about earlier with Australia and the Philippines. Alex Chidiak's team, uh, Jeff Chiba, also has uh, a Filipino player named Quinley Cruzada, but it's been good news for Alex. Uh, well, in in at least one sense with. Jeff United defeating Uro Reds 2-1 on the weekend. But I think you were telling us off Mike Dale, not, it's not been quite as good news for Alex personally because she's not um, playing. Look, put it this way. I've spent more times in Japanese restaurants since lockdown lifted than uh, Alex GDX played football in Japan. Um, she's played. She's only got 87 minutes in six games. Um, she was an unused substitute this week. Um, she's been getting kind of like a run off the bench Every now and then, I think in their first game against Urawa, 
uh, they she got 45 minutes. She basically got the first the whole first half. But I'm not sure what the story is. Um, obviously, my Japanese isn't best at the, uh, great at the best of times, but um, haven't really been you know reading in detail. Um, on chids, but yeah, it doesn't look like she's getting a hell of a lot of a run over there, which is sad because I mean, the league, I, I would have assumed that the league really suits her. But in saying that, um, because it's a relatively new league, I think that they play each other three times. So they like they get 20 games, which is really good. Um, other thing that I learned about the WE League is that they don't have buys, they have women's empowerment round. Now, I don't know what that means, but that's what it says on the website. Um, so make of that information what you will. <laughs> Maybe it's something as exciting as Star Wars round or. Yeah. <laughs> every week, every week a team feels empowered by getting the week off. <laughs> I don't know, but yeah, she's, um, they're kind of, uh, they're mid table from memory. So, uh, and yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's you disappointing. Know. Cause I guess that's the thing. Like when at, she was at Atletico, uh, and not getting the game time there. And, and we all think, you know, she's got such potential and we just want to see her getting game time wherever she's playing. Mm. So um, hopefully that can turn around. Okay. So I think moving over back to Europe, there were two big games overnight uh, with both FA Cup semi finals. So Arsenal was Arsenal versus Brighton and Manchester City versus Chelsea. But uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to really catch up on that but uh, what stood out from those games to you Madge? Oh look I just I watched the highlights of the the Chelsea Man City game and and I think a lot of the commentary has been around um, Chelsea weren't necessarily that fantastic but there were probably a, a couple of goalkeeping errors that um that really flattered the scoreline for them uh, a couple yeah the the first two goals that the goalkeeper really should have taken care of um uh, but I, I did have a, then a quick look at the Arsenal game as well. Um, and uh, Beth Mead scored an absolute fantastic goal, sort of like mm. t- um, running it out of defence and then getting the ball back and and putting it across the keeper. Uh, I think they ended up winning. So both games, I think, were 3-0 in the end, if I remember correct. So, so yeah, nice. I mean, good old, I mean, you know, Chelsea-Arsenal final, it's, it's, it's um, not unexpected. Yeah, it's definitely not a surprise given uh, the way those two teams have played this season. Uh, Dale, any, any particular thoughts from the FA Cup semifinals? Uh, I mean, I think Madge covered it. I, I was uh, not completely surprised with either of the results. Um, Manchester City have so, so many injuries at the moment. Um, and it's I don't think it's particularly shocking to see them kind of get put away the way that they were. Um but it, it's still, you know, it's still not a great look. Um, 3 0 at home uh, is never great, especially when you're the holders. Um, but as as Madge said, I mean, Taib's um, goalkeeping was was not not fantastic. Um, uh, there, I can't remember who the commentator was, um, but uh, it was it was it was pretty painful listening when I think it was. Okay, is Katie Katie Brown? Katie Brown's the ex England goalkeeper. Um, can't remember her first name, but um, the second and, one was just like she was flat on her feet and yeah, even the first goal, she just get it just beat her to the front post and like she didn't put a hand up for it. And I was just like, mate, they're, they're the big things attached to your arms. Like, get them in the way. Um, in terms of the Arsenal game, um, Viv Meadem I was rested, which meant that Caitlin Ford started. If I was Ford, I probably would have been kicking myself. She had a few really, really good opportunities in this game to kind of get get kind of on the score sheet. Um, not her, you know, I think she played relatively well, but it obviously wasn't her best best performance. Uh, but they were pretty cruisy. I mean, um, they, it was it was a really uh, kind of stout defensive effort from Brighton in the first half. But I think once once Arsenal went one up, it was just a matter until they like a matter of time until they kind of started putting them away, um, and and eventually they did. Um, the goals that, uh, as Madge mentioned, the, the first goal was pretty scrappy. It's just a matter of being there at the, the right time. But again, um, you know, it's a pretty big result for Brighton to make the semi finals of an FA Cup, considering that they haven't really been kind of a high performance club for a long time. So you know, full credit to them. But um, it's, this is going to be a really great game. Um, the final, and it's at Wembley as well. So, um, two London clubs at Wembley. That I reckon they'll probably crack 50k for this one, if I'm honest. 
That would be um, fantastic. And also, um, it would be a great way to cap off um, dub opening weekend. Um, not mm. sure not sure when I'm going to sleep, but I mean, in the words of the great Anne Odong, sleep is for the week. So I, mean, I suppose yes, I should sleep just stop complaining. Dead. That's why we have different time zones. Yes. <laughs> okay, true. so on to news and other Aussies abroad. So the two in France. Uh, so Ellie Carpenter's Leon. I have not been quite been quick enough to figure figure out how much time game time our Aussies got, but Leon with you know, just another six one victory away to Soyo. I mean, it's Leon. They'd probably be disappointed that they conceded. Mm. But Mary Fowler's uh, Montpellier had a much more interesting game, uh, going uh, going behind in the sixth minute. Then, uh, so they were away to Saint Etienne. Then Saint Etienne went down to ten players. Then Montpellier went down to ten players, and then they scored twice in stoppage time to win two one. So I mean, mm. I'd like to see highlights of that. Yeah. Uh, on to Italy, and it was not good news. I don't oh know. Mixed news for the two Aussies there. Uh, Lazio featuring El Mastro Antonio and I believe Isabella Folletta as well. They lost 2-0 mm-hmm. away to Empoli, but it was better news for Ivy Lewick and Pomigliano who defeated Hellas Verona 2-1. On Ivy, check yep. out her Instagram. She's got some awesome um, Halloween photos that they ah, yes. with her. So they look I've good. been a huge fan of the Halloween content from across the Woso spectrum. Um, yes. Arsenal's, hey, Arsenal's was very good as well. Mm. <laughs> yep. I know um, uh, uh, Rusha Lidadron's twin sister dressed up as Rusha and made fun of her injury problems. And um, in her Instagram post, she said, now I know what it's like to be ugly and tagged her, which was brutal, but I suppose that's just the kind of family they have. (laughs) Oh, God, the Irish never let you sleep. (laughs) Yes, it's actually, um, they do also, what makes it, well, from what I understand, what would add to this is um, their Irish descent, they're actually, they grew up in Scotland and Mm. that is... Completely oh, consistent with my um, understanding of how yeah. the Scottish talk to each other. Yes. I play golf with two Scottish people. It's That's correct. <laughs> yeah. I used to play for the Scottish is, club back yeah. in Canberra and it was, yeah, pretty pretty brutal. I Golf is like the last sport I'd want to play with Scottish people. That oh, just, don't yeah. worry. I mean, and, and they complain about the English all the time. But Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the, Scots, the Scots invented golf purely so they could have more time to talk about other people. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Ah, uh, yeah. So what? So yeah. Uh, where was I? It was before we got distracted with Halloween. Oh yeah. By the way, of course, I believe you shared this on. I think you. Did I see you share this on Twitter, Madge? I mean, everyone did. Um, the best Halloween costume possibly of all time. That bloody hexagon. Well, there's from, my yes. queen of the week gone. <laughs> so good. <laughs> that was going to be one of my queens of the week. Yes, yeah, fantastic. I can, you can still. And be also, because I went and stalked, I went and stalked her Twitter. It's like she's. I think she's a Portland fan. So she's a, she's a US fan who did it. So. There's Very the good. reach. There's the reach of the um of that awful uh, coverage from last year. It made it worldwide. It was the attention to detail. She had the score bug. Yep. She had the score bug very, on very top. Good. I thought that's just. And I, the I players, admire that so she much. Had little Lego people as the players. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um yeah, on to one other thing uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, Amy Harrison's. PSV Eindhoven, uh, 1-0 win over Alkmaar with an 88th minute winner, but not quite so good news for Amy herself. She didn't get off the bench. And now, if yep, yes, I've just checked and the man I was thinking of is here. Welcome, Stefan. Just in time to start our Nordic content. How have you been? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Good to see you all and hear you all. Um, yeah, just in time, as you said. Um, let's start with, um, with Norway. Uh, on the weekend... There were no top Syrian games. There are there are two rounds left, um, but they did play the their cup final, and um, the team leading the competition, Sandviken, had a uh, a loss a um, against uh, fourth place Valeringa. So Valeringa uh, are defending top Syrian champions, and they started off the season a little unconvincingly, but as the season's wearing on, they're actually looking stronger and stronger. So. Uh, yeah, a bit of an upset there in the cup final. They defeated San Vicken two uh, one away, and uh, San Vicken is obviously um, Tegan Micah's previous uh, previous club. So yeah, so it was a would have been an interesting one to see. I didn't actually get to see that one, but uh, 
it uh, sounds like it was a spicy affair. So, uh, yeah, top Syrian starts again next week. Um, I'll move on to Sweden. Um, Sweden are um, resuming their, their uh, Dunhill Svenskan uh, competition and um, they, play, they played round 21 of 22. Uh, most of the games there are, are done, bar a couple, um, for this for this round. So um, one of the ones that isn't that hasn't been played yet is um, Rosengard's game with uh, featuring Charlie Grant and Tegan Micah. And they play at uh, fourth host Eskils Tuna United tonight. Um, but uh, Dylan Holmes, um, her team BK Hacken, who are coming second. So both those teams are, are sure Champions League places, as I think we might have mentioned already. They were four 0 winners at home against ninth place Jur Gardens, and Dylan uh, didn't get a run off the bench with that game. Now the third Champions League place is where it gets really spicy in Sweden. Um, a few years back they didn't have three places, but they do now. Um, Teams right through from ladder positions three to eight are in the hunt, I think. So uh, that middle part of the table um, is really congested and there's a lot of lot of movement going on there. So it was a big game for, for Polks' team, Vizio, uh, who are currently fifth and they're up against 10th placed AIK in the weekend uh, with one game, they were one game behind the third place, uh, third place team. So... Um, unfortunately, they had a loss, a one-nil loss away. So it was probably a, a bad time to to do that. Um, and they would have been disappointed, I think, with that result. Um, Polk's managed to play a full game after getting on a 30-hour flight back from Australia. So that's pretty remarkable. Um, and um, eighth-placed Rebro has the possibility uh, um, of jumping ahead of both Vizio and Hammerby. If they play, if they beat the eleventh place Patea on 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 in their game t- um, tonight, so uh, yeah, lots happening there. So a bit disappointing. How tight is the table if eighth place can jump? Yeah, They're still in the running. Yeah, eighth out of twelve. It's 12. a twelve team league, right? So it's um, it's uh, yeah, I think it's twelve. Uh, yes, it is twelve. Um, it's mathematically possible. So I think the the bottom teams towards that clump would have to have big wins. But yeah, certainly, um, I think if Vizio had had won this game, um, they would have been equal third and uh, really in the hunt. So it's disappointing that that didn't happen. Um, Hammerby, where KK is, at least Callan Knight, um, they lost 1 3 at home to Lynn Chirpings. And Uchenna Kanu scored a hat trick for the visitors, who um, jump ahead of Hammerby now on goal difference. So they're part of that congested clump. And of course, KK is still recovering from her injury and, and not not playing at the moment. And finally, uh, ending um, um, the round on a pretty amazing note, um, Veco, where Nona Heatley is playing, they pulled off the upset of the season. They've only won one game um, up to date, and that was fairly recently. But they defeated third place Christian Stards in just their second away win. Um, so that's pretty pretty amazing. Uh, it was a one nil victory. Uh, and Winnie was an unused substitute in that game. So it leaves the team holding up the ladder, but um, that would have been very exciting for, for them, um, you know, defeating a, a team that's so highly placed on the ladder. And it, it doesn't hurt Christian Stards at this stage either. They're still in third spot. So still uh, vying for that third Champions League place. But, yeah, it would have been a pretty big big day and night, I think, for, for Vecco uh, with that win. And uh, finally, over to Denmark, um, Fortuna Hearing. After a bit of an average draw last last round, just before the international window, they um, they had a, a strong five nil away win against winless AAB, which is the Alborg side. It keeps them second in in on the ladder and on track for Champions League participation. Claire Wheeler, she um, she started the game, played ninety minutes. Same 30-hour trip as Polk's, scored her first goal for the club. So um, that was the um, the team's second goal in this game in the 29th minute. And Alex Swin started the game and was replaced by Angie Beard at half time. So both players uh, had half a game each. And Indy Riley was an unused substitute. So I hope everything's all right with her there with as far as injuries and things. Um, and finally... Yeah, I just want to say that goal, Claire Wheeler goal, is worth, well worth finding on... Socials, if you can, it's um, the kind of things, uh, kind of 
move you'd be very familiar with if you watch a play for Sydney FC or Sydney University or even Newcastle Jets Academy if you go back that far. Need one two on the edge on the edge of the box and a tidy finish. So I'm glad I'm glad that I uh, that came to my attention on the weekend. Yeah. So obviously playing a little further upfield than she was for the Matildas. So yeah, it's, it was it was a nice move. Yep. Um, and finally, Jenna McCormick is playing tonight. Uh, she's playing um, for uh, AGF Aarhus against uh, or Aarhus, I think you pronounce it, against uh, six players, Colding BK, and uh, they're currently seventh. So they'll be hoping for for some joy there. Um, and before I move away, I've got this uh, Cambria United background on my thing here, and I hardly ever talk about Cambria United, so if I may, I might might just have a quick mention about their um, signings tomorrow. They've, they've currently got 14 mm-hmm. in the squad, and they've got six midfielders, three defenders, and three forwards, and two, two goalkeepers. So really hoping that one of the two signings tomorrow is a central defender. That would be nice. I think it's... Uh, we're all looking for defenders. Yeah. yeah. It's a very it's Australian thing. Oh. Yeah. On the, Any uh, particular on defender the, that's unsigned that you On watch? the Huring game, just, just before we oh. move on, uh, yeah. you'll never guess who got a yellow card in that game, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> is she of Southeast Asian descent like me? She is. Alex Indeed. Quinn picked up a first half yellow card before uh, being substituted at halftime. <laughs> I just went and found it. Yeah, that is <laughs> absolutely sensational. I So Claire Wheeler breezing past defenders and Alex Hewan running into Alex them very Green hard. Kick, kicking them. Yes, it's um, yes. You can take uh, the woman out of Australia, et cetera. Yes. That's, that's, uh, yes. But just quickly, sorry, back on Canberra. Um, Canberra ran a really skinny squad last year, 18 to start mm. with. So um, they'll only have two more signings after this. Um, really? Mm. Yeah. Um, they, they signed uh, two train-ons with uh, Amy Ilioski and Sasha Grove. Make yeah. it so that, that became tw- So that became 20 in the end. Yeah, yeah. In the end, and 21 with Chantel Jones when she came on board. Yep. But yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, they're almost there with their mm. with their squad. So they, it's, a, it's interesting because the floor, like in terms of the salary cap, the floor is doesn't change. So um, it'll be interesting to see. Like they've obviously got a little bit of a kitty left over, you would assume. But it, it I mean, obviously they're not they're, they're not going to be able to get any. Or many international players in, but yeah, it is interesting to see how that will work in terms of the salary cap uh, and whether they'll have to kind of pick and choose some some players, ACT based players down the road. Mm. Well, yeah, yeah. look, great. I know Grace Gill has has a stand sport stuff going on. You know, if they need a need a number ten, just chuck her in there. That's the worst it's thing really they can do. Worse. Yeah. Yes. Um. Yeah. So, like, do you? Is there any? Particular central defender that's not signed that you would like to be announced tomorrow by Canberra? Um, no, I hadn't really, really thought of that. Um, I mean, obviously not going to get Kendall back, so that's that's a long shot. Mm. Um, but yeah, not 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 really. Um, does anyone what's come to point for you? What's Ivy Lewick up to? So, uh, in Italy with Pomigliano. Oh, of course, they don't have the winter break. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they're trolling a few down there, having a bit of a, yeah. a few weeks yeah, of training. Be... They're in the second week of training. so I suspect mm. the same thing's happening in Brisbane. Yep. Yeah. I was just thinking, like, surely there's – because those uh, – the players who won't be playing in the Champions League uh, will be, you would assume – coming home for the winter break before they go back over for the, mm. the second half of the season if they're not already signed. I can always um, hope for Polks. Yeah. Well, that was what I, that was what I, I was thinking. Was well, like I mean, if, to be honest, I'd like to see her try and um, yeah. continue to stay in Europe, but um, but if she doesn't get a gig, yeah. we will always take her back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, I mean, she's got, like, she's played in, uh, where is she at the moment? She's in Norway at the moment. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so she's in Sweden, so she has an EU, like a work permit, so she could play in, in Europe potentially. So that's definitely a positive. Um, but, yeah, a lot of those players who are kind of coming up to their winter break or the end of the season, I'd, I'd love to get some of them back as well. I assume that uh, – would it be a case of um, ha- the A-League women clubs having to work out loan deals with the Scandinavian clubs? Yeah, so it's paperwork. You'd, uh, you'd assume as such. I mean, because um, – 
I'm assuming that Emma Checker would be coming back on loan or she was at Selfos on loan either way. Yep. Um, but like, I can't imagine that a W League team would be a parent club in this situation because mm-hmm. generally when there were American teams, they would always be on permanent deals with the American teams. Yes. Yeah. Um, speaking of, uh, we're at the pointy end of the season in the NWSL. Um, we are. Uh, Van Egmond, Emily Van Egmond didn't get a run this week because Orlando had a bye. Uh, yeah. But the NWSL has expanded their final series to six of their, I don't know, 48 teams. I don't know. American sport is weird. Um, but so four th- uh, sorry, three through six play uh, this week. Um, so uh, let me have a look. Uh, I just had it here. That's very frustrating. Um, Chicago, uh, Chicago are hosting one game and so are Washington Spirit. Um, they're both playing at their respective, uh, well, the old uh, major league soccer venue. So that's pretty cool to see. Really good to see that um, Washington spirit are playing their biggest games at uh, DC United stadium, which is great. Uh, and obviously uh, Chicago red stars have been playing their games for the majority of their, you know, tenure in Chicago at, uh, at Bridgeview. Um, and then the winners of those games go on to face uh, OL rain next weekend. Uh, and Portland, uh, are the other team after having won the supporter shield. And then I have a feeling that Portland is hosting the final again this year. Don't quote me on that. I know that I'm meant to be a news source in this segment, but please do not quote me on that. Um, also in terms of, uh, you know, uh, tight leagues. Um, if you like tight leagues, may I suggest the FA women's championship where teams three through 10 are, Four parts, four points apart from each other. Um, so definitely one to watch out for. Uh, Liverpool have been doing pretty well there, but I think Durham will probably be the most likely team to go up at the moment. Oh. Okay. Um, so I think moving on, I think it's basically time for uh, our Queens of the Week. So I kind of ruined this for Madge earlier, but I mean, really, your Queen of the Week. We we can't talk enough about this person. Well, yeah, I mean, and I've, I've got, always got to back up as well, but I, I, her name was um, Margaret Sealer. And from what I can tell, uh, yeah, US fan with the best Halloween costume mm. um, going around um, with the hexagonal, uh, I don't know what you call it, the the obstruction that just annoyed <laughs> last year. So brilliant actually absolutely brilliant and the fact that she was tossing up between the hexagon and the tuba guy yes tuba man um, we love a bit of tuba man love yeah. it I love we were talking one. about that off mic as as uh, around what like uh a league uh what would be your kind of halloween costume um Good suggestions. Uh, Samantha Lewis mentioned um, go as Costa Barbarossa's taping the <laughs> net back on the post. Um, there was Caitlin Cooper and Ivy Luke getting their shoelaces tangled. Um, I think next week, uh, next year, I might go as a David Squires cartoon. Um, there's, there's, I mean, the, we hate that sometimes the A leagues are referred to as meme leagues, but we do love the memes in this league. <laughs> I just love that uh, when she, uh, when Margaret posted it, she's quoting her own tweet from January. So yes. <laughs> I love a long-term plan coming together like yes. that. Yes, <laughs> it's all about the long con. Yes. So the, I do have another. I do have another. Um, I think we we should give it a shout out. But Carly Lloyd retiring from um, the mm. U.S. Women's National Team. Um, I think. She can be a bit of a divisive player, um, but, I mean, you, you you can't argue with the stats there. 316 games, 134 goals for the U.S. Women's National Team, two World Cups, um, two Olympic gold medals. Uh, we can't forget that hat trick against Japan in the 2015 World Cup final, including that goal from basically halfway. Um, mm-hmm. I, I Only think woman I, to score I'm, a hat trick in a, in a World Cup final. I absolutely. mean, she'll... Like that, that's that's a record that, in my opinion, will probably stand the test of time. And I'm pretty first. sure I haven't just imagined this, but it's, tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm fairly sure at the France World Cup, they renamed a bunch of the stations around Paris and I'm, and one of them was renamed after her as well. And, of course, and, and two times um, world player, FIFA world player of the year. So mm. I, I think inarguably one of America's top five greatest ever women's footballers, soccer players. 
Yes, sorry, that's better. <laughs> um, yeah, is she the record holder for caps? It's like the number you've said, I've forgotten because it's. You know really what? I, I tried to search stats, and it was very annoying. She's, a lot of yeah, I'm not sure. She's definitely close, but um, Christy Rampone is still the all-time American cap, caps leader. Yeah. Um, and she played, if I recall correctly, between yeah, this is a good one, like 1996 and 2018, Oof. which is uh, offensive. Uh, my queen of the week is the Brazilian fans. Um, they were really fun. Like that game was just amazing and made all the better by the atmosphere that they created. The, the scenes after the, after the match were, I mean, something else. I mean, we, we, we always know about like how passionate South Americans are in terms of their, their support for their national teams, but in, in football in general, um, but I think um, from what I was told by uh, a fellow member of the the press bubble, for want of a word, there was a, a kind of a ring around for, uh, there was a big push from one of the local uh, South American radio stations in, in Sydney to get as many Brazilian fans out to the game as possible. And like they, there was no way that they were COVID safe, but that who cares? Like they were just having a great old time. Um, the scenes of Marta basically emptying her luggage like out into the stand, all of it with signatures on it was really great. Um, but the noise that they made was was something else. The, the Chile games were really, really good. Um, obviously, I don't know if there was, <clears throat> I think it was also because the Brazil fans were really tightly packed together, but like, man, they were fantastic. So kudos to them um, and Brazil the Brazilian team as well. Um, and a special shout out to whoever it was from, as you mentioned to me, Eric from football Australia, who swiftly took the the match balls away from the Brazilian teams after they were kicking a few of them up into the stand at a, at a price point of about $200 each. Yep. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Um, yeah. And also, well, I mean, this, I, it's carried on into the post-match presser and Tracy Holmes mm. apologized because she was in the car park where the Brazilian fans were continuing to uh, beat the drums and, and yeah. quite the racket. So yeah, like when is- I left, I walked down O'Connell street towards the train station and that like, there would have been probably 300 people out, out the kind of Southwest end of, uh, of Parramatta stadium or pet, sorry, Southeast end of Parramatta stadium, just making noise. And it was just fantastic. And I mean, it's not something that we really get to experience a lot here in Australia. Um, that kind of level of, of, um, you know, coordinated musical passion. Um, but also I think that we all knew that this may be the last time that we ever see Marta play live in Australia and to be there for that was was pretty pretty special, to be honest. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll put my Maz, my Matilda's Active Support hat on here and it's like, I mean, that's absolutely the, the type of atmosphere that we'd love to get going mm. uh, as mm. a home end for the Matildas. You yeah. Know, you know, upcoming friendlies and... Um, especially because it was so inclusive and, you know, everyone was involved and it was good and it was, you know, good fun. Um, I guess one thing that's really hard with Aussies, we're a bit reserved. So, mm. I mean, it's like, come on. I mean, a lot of people love sitting back and watching the atmosphere, but they don't necessarily want to get down and amongst it. So yeah. I really encourage everyone. It's like, well, if you, if you want the atmosphere, let's be the atmosphere and, you know, mm. get down to the home end and, and support and, and cheer for the team. Um, and it's also, I mean, it's one of those things where you're uh, away from home as well. Uh, the, the impetus, like, like you said, the ring around of the Brazilian fans, but it was similar for us when we travel and we were travelling over to France. We had an awesome team march in, in Grenoble um, to the game there for the mm. Matildas where, you know, we did a blocked traffic and had um, all the, the cars beeping at us as, as um, we had the, <laughs> all the Aussie fans. Mm. Um, going to the stadium, so absolutely, that's the type of stuff we want to get going for. Yeah, for the World Cup. Well, I mean, we're only really like what eighteen months away, so I yeah. got to get on it. If you want to be the change, you got to be the change you want to see in the world. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Stefan, um, we've already covered this, but once again, uh, who is your Queen of the Week? Yeah, my vote goes to Claire Wheeler for. Uh, what must have been just about her biggest uh, ever week in, in football, perhaps, or one of her biggest weeks after um, her, um, you know, really impressive and busy second half for the Matildas against Brazil. 
backing that up with that long flight back to back to Denmark and then uh, playing 90 minutes and scoring her first goal for the club. So, yeah, on you, Claire. Well done. Yep. And uh, my queen of the week is a player that is close to my heart and even closer to my skin. So Denise O'Sullivan scored the winner in uh, the Republic of Ireland's 2-1 win over Finland. She was named player of the match. She overcame an injury cloud, I think, from their previous game against Sweden. She screamed at Megan Connolly to take the free kick, which led to the first goal. So I'll give her an assist for that as well. So, and um, of course, like all of you, that's, that's another nation who would be hoping to be here in 2023. And that would be, I believe, their first World Cup appearance. And I suppose that's it, unless anyone has anything else. I think that's all well. I've just gotten to the end of the little script that Cheryl kindly wrote for us before she had to attend to other duties. So I suppose oh, that's I think a yep. quick quick shout out. Um, Cheryl did have a king of the week. Um, Josh yes. Carlo. That's right. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Uh, you know, coming out um, recently this week. Um, um, I believe the first professional, active professional um, male player in the world to come out as gay. So really brave uh, announcement by Josh. But uh, yeah, the fact that he just the relief that you saw in, in the video uh, mm. after the announcement and the support um, that's come from a lot of the ma- major clubs and players around the world. It's fantastic to see and and hopefully we'll see more of it uh, so people can uh, live their true authentic selves in, in all realms of their lives. Yeah, well said, well said yeah, yeah. Madge. And also thanks to Cheryl for um, pointing that out. So I suppose it is time to wrap up. Thanks very much to Madge, Dale, and Stefan. And this is Eric. Uh, thanks, thanks for listening to the Beyond 90 Pod once again, and we'll catch you all next time. 